So God, bless the conversation today. Let wisdom be shared. Let it flow. And just, I break off any barriers. Amen. Amen. And over Cody, Lord Jesus, I declare abundance, prosperity, territory taking with this podcast, Lord Thank Jesus. You, and the Cody Cottle Show will begin to spike up in downloads, Lord Jesus. Thank Amen. You. Amen. Amen. Welcome back, guys, to another episode of the Cody Cottle Show. And I'm just so pumped about this episode because I've been really wanting to get these individuals on the show. You know, you are going to learn today on this episode how to have a thriving marriage, how to have great sex inside of your marriage, mm -hmm. even in a world that we feel like is falling apart. I have Tony and Elisa DeLorenzo. They have the number one, number one marriage podcast in the entire world. One extraordinary marriage. Let's just take a pause to appreciate that. Guys, go. Thank Look you. up One Extraordinary Marriage, hit subscribe, go leave a five-star review, start listening to it. I listen to it. Me and my girlfriend, Esther, listen to your podcast. There's a lot of episodes we got to like three X to when you really get into the sex because we're not married yet and we live in purity. Yeah. Uh, but they've also authored six books, their latest book is the six pillars of intimacy. Uh, we actually got one of their black boxes where we got like all the workbooks and everything yeah, with it. Right. Guys, go on Amazon, Amazon bestseller, uh, and just prophesying over you guys that this will replace the five love languages as Let's the go. number one marriage book in the entire world. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just an honor to have you guys here. Oh my gosh, Cody, we're so excited. The, Thank you for having us. Your energy is so great. And I love just how you how you bring that to your audience. Right, getting excited about a topic and then really being able to share that with people is huge. Well, I'm just so passionate. Like I meet people and I'm like, man, I see the call God has on your life. Mm -hmm. Like I remember Tony's always like, our mission is just to impact one marriage. That's right. Yeah. Like how cool is that? You've identified like, hey God, you've given us these gifts. We've had to work through this in our own marriage. We've built this business and we want to impact one marriage through this. And I'm like, if I can give the microphone to you and make that a little louder and reach even one more marriage, then like I'm doing yeah. what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. that's what we tell the one family all the time. This isn't just about Tony and Elisa. This is about you. This is about you taking the six pillars of intimacy. This is about you seeing the, the neighbor across the street who's struggling and you being able to go just like you said, hey, listen to this podcast. I don't know where you're at right now, but I know they have over 700 episodes. Go listen. See what mm. it could do to your marriage. And then when we do that, we impact one marriage and, and somebody else impacts one marriage and somebody else impacts one marriage. We, we change families. We change communities that way. Yeah. And it all starts from the family. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you can change the home and you can change the family, you can literally shift culture. I Absolutely. truly believe that everything stems from the home. hundred percent. Like our childhood traumas and lack of parenting in the home, lack of mm -hmm. love in the home, all these things then show up in our adult years and other areas which impact culture mm -hmm. and influence society. So I'm, I'm passionate. So guys, just, you know, we're going to have a lot of fun on this show. We're going to have a lot of fun today. I got some stuff I'm about to throw right, these guys off. Here we go. Uh, we're going to dive into some wisdom so you guys can expect that. But let, let's get into the fun part. Um, I, I I just want to break the ice, even though like the ice already been broken naturally with you guys. We're going to go deeper. Uh, what, I'm going to ask this to Elisa. Okay. Would you rather go into the past and meet your ancestors or go into the future and meet your great, great grandchildren? Oh my gosh. Great, great grandchildren. Why? It's all about legacy for Tony and I. And mm -hmm. so being in this place where it's like, what are the seeds that we're sowing now? Where are they going to show up? Mm. And so to be able to see what our great, great grandchildren are like and the lives that they're living. Oh my gosh. That's, that actually just excites me. And think so of like the fruit that you get to see from like the legacy that you created. A hundred percent. I'm in yes. agreement with yeah. you. Great grandchildren. Yeah. So Tony, let's go over to you. Would you rather have the ability to see 10 minutes into the future or 150 years in the future. Oh, this is kind of similar to hers, but we'll go with it. I think I would go 150 years. Why? I would want to see where we're at mm. and then to be able to go, okay, and in 150 years, where, where were we or where are we? Mm -hmm. And can I then where I am now impact change mm. to see the world change in 150 years? Wow. In one way or the other. So you're saying like, if I could get a glimpse of 150 years from now, what would I do now to even further influence that? Exactly. Yeah. That's totally Tony. That's so good. Yeah. So Tony. I'm very futuristic too. Like in my strength finders, that's one of my top 10, right? Like I'm always thinking about that and you get, to, and it'd be cool, right? Like even think about this book, like what if we could see 150 years from now, the legacy that it made, the amount yeah. of marriages that were impacted. Yeah. That's crazy. Fortunately, I've had already had the privilege to start to see it as we've seen um, families that have been a part of our one family, our tribe for the last 13 years. We're now, last year we had two wedding invitations. Wow. To, 
children whose parents, you know, had started listening years and years and years ago, and now they are adults getting married and living out extraordinary marriages because they're parents. Can you imagine, like, you guys are going to have, like, my grandparents went to you, uh-huh. my parents went to you, now me and my wife go to you. What I tell our team all the time when I, when I talk about the one marriage, when I'm talking to the team and I'm saying, hey, whatever you're working on, our impact today is to impact one marriage. Mm. And I go, it's not about what's happening now. And we may never even hear about the marriages and the families we're impacting. I go, but think about what it's going to be like when we're in heaven, when we're, we're just hanging out and we're yeah. doing these things and people are going to come up to us and go, because of what you're willing to say and what you were willing to share, my great grandparents or my grandparents or my parents were able to work through their difficulties and have the extraordinary marriage Wow, that allowed me to experience it. And I mean, I just, that's what I sort of see. And I, I just go, wow, what, what are the millions, what, what are the millions and millions of people that we can have an impact on? Yeah. It's just crazy to think about rather than getting divorced, that they actually worked through it and what impact did that have on the children mm-hmm. and what impact did that have on their children right. and their children? That's cool. All right. Last one. Uh, I'm going to ask both of you guys this <laughs> just a little different. What's the worst job you've ever had? We just want to know. I worked for Enterprise Rent-A-Car out of college and that, we- that over what was it like Carl's Jr. or whatever? <laughs> Well, I worked at Wendy's in high school, but I think everybody's kind of got their, like a lot of people have their sort of fast food experience, but we lived out in the Palm Springs, Palm Desert area. So over our summer when it's like 120 degrees and you're like, it was hot. And that was, I mean, I don't know if Enterprise still does this, but that was back in the day when we were all like business dress. Mm -hmm. And so it was like business suits and washing cars, which is a really awful combination when it's 120 (laughs) degrees outside. So I'm just, I'm going to go with that one. That's pretty bad. What do you got, Tony? My worst job. It was college days and I was really, really low on money. And I remember having, and I got a job delivering back in the day, phone books. And it was very interesting because- You had a phone book route? Did you ride the bicycle too? (laughs) (laughs) It was really interesting though, because back in the day, it was sort of like they had this, it's almost like a circus type atmosphere. There's like these guys that would just sort of roam and and follow the phone book deliveries, <laughs> literally. And it was like middle of winter and they would do this. And so the, the sort of this band of people would come to deliver phone books, but then they'd always need help from the local folks. And I was just, I needed money. So it was a very- Was it like the magazine time. boys? I'm like, what is that? Have you guys ever seen that? I've seen that with, they travel and sell magazines. They're like- door to door magazine sales. And they're like in a group and they move around different areas. They came to my home in South Carolina one time. They were trying to recruit me. Like, yeah, we like travel around. We like go to different cities and we like sell magazines door to door and we get people on subscriptions. Okay. There you go. But we weren't selling anything. We were just (laughs) dropping off the yellow pages at the door. Just delivery. We were just delivering it. There was no sales or anything. So did you join the circus? No, I (laughs) I mean, after a while I was just like, "I, I can't do this anymore. Like this is wild. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Well, I got to share mine because my first job was the worst job I've ever had. And it was like, uh, but it also was the best. And I'll I'll explain. So it was corn detasseling. So I grew up in Michigan and farmers would come in and it was Simmons corn detasseling at Otsego High School. And when you were 13 years old, you were old enough to do farmhand work, but not 16 or 15 and old enough to get a real job. So they would go in and offer, I made 525 an hour. Come on. I would get up at like 4.30 a.m. I'd have to be the bus by about 5.30 a.m. My mom would have to take me. She hated it. And I would go work in a cornfield all day tasseling corn. But in the morning, the dew would set on the field. So the crops were, you'd get soaked head to toe. So I had to wear rain gear like head to toe and i had to detassel corn walking or in a basket on a tractor then it would get hot because it's summer and you had to take the rain gear off and then the corn has rough you'd get what's called corn rash and it would rub on your cheeks and your face and your arms because you're walking through cornfields all day so it would like cut you and give you rashes what i made 525 an hour i bought my first laptop at 13 years old with my own money i was so stoked about it worst job i've ever had but taught me hard work Mm -hmm. yeah there's not a single thing I've done to this day since that first job that has been that hard. Corn detasseling. Corn detasseling. Some Midwest wow. farmer boy stuff right wow. there. Yeah, I grew up in Ohio and like corn, 
I hate detaching <laughs> corn. I mean that like I, I don't I even do know that. what it is. That's I grew up in California. No, no, yeah. we didn't actually take this stuff off. This oh, is uh, is it, it taking the heads off? Yeah, really? at the top because there's male and female. So have you ever uh, seen corn crops where one row's taller? Yeah, and then there's like four rows that are shorter than a taller row oh. because there's male. We're talking about corn sex. And female corn. We're talking about corn sex right okay. now. I mean, I, I <laughs> thought we'd go there because we got the marriage <laughs> podcast. Talk about male and female corn. Here we go. All right, Stop so this. we'll get into it. Fun, that fun's over. Now we're gonna go deep because I just like to switch it up. But whoever's listening to this, we're like they're gonna be on their toes. They're not ready for what's coming next. All right. All right. So we're just gonna go right deep. What do you value most in life? For myself, it's relationships. Uh, yeah, I knew that was your answer immediately. And it, it's it's my relationship with Jesus, and then it's my relationship with Elisa, my relationship with my kiddos, and then my relationships with my friends and family. Mm. And yeah, that's what I really value the most. I, I do believe those relationships that we have are vital. Yeah. And yeah. They can be restored. There, there's restoration in some of those relationships. You know, sometimes we have fallouts with people. They may be family. They may be friends. But how do we rebuild those? Because they're just there's so much value in them. So good. How about you, Lisa? I was going to say people. It's a little bit different in the sense that I get so much energy from like with what I do with one extraordinary marriage and whatnot. But it, but even just having certain people in my life, like key people that really um, know how to encourage, know how to challenge. You know, because you've got to have those people in your life yeah. that will challenge you. You can't just have all the people that are in agreement with you. Um, but also the people that I've been able to pour into and the people that mentor me. Mm. And so, I mean, it's probably very similar to, to you with relationships. I do love that you call our, you know, 20 year old son a kiddo still. Like, <laughs> like you said that. I'm like, Dad, stop, calling, stop me calling me a kiddo. Yeah. That's so good. And, and it's cool because you see what you guys do professionally now with One Extraordinary Marriage. Mm -hmm. And I always love asking, like, what do you value the most? And it's like, you value relationships and people. What only makes sense that you guys would serve, you know, marriages because mm -hmm. it involves both people and relationships. Mm -hmm. right. So that's really cool. So let's get into uh, One Extraordinary Marriage mm -hmm. because, you know, like, I think it's so important, like everything like we talked about in the beginning stems from the family. Right. And if we can help people have better marriages, they're going to have better home life, better families. The kids are going to be raised up better. Mm -hmm. So let's get into that. You know, what advice can we start with with you guys? Take us through the framework. Mm -hmm. How does one achieve an extraordinary marriage? Well, I'm going to say, I'm going to actually steal Tony's line because this is usually where he jumps in. He's like, it's only two things. It's only two things. Uh, be intentional and take action. Mm. You know, at the end of the day, great relationships happen when those two things happen. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. Yes, we're talking about marriage, but it, it doesn't matter if it's a work relationship. It doesn't matter if it's a friendship. When you're intentional and you take action, everything in that relationship can shift. Mm, okay. I love that. Mm -hmm. Now, someone might say, okay, I hear you guys. and Be intentional and take action. Can you help me be clear on what I need to be intentional about? Sure. sure absolutely. You have to, you know, it's looking at, you know, specifically within the marriage relationship, you know, there are a lot of different areas where people can be like, oh, you know what? You just need to, like the old wisdom when Tony and I were married 26 years ago was you need to talk more and you need to date your, your wife. That's what, Th that's what they would always say to us guys. <laughs> like basically just talk to her and, and go out on a date. Go on date night and just talk to her more. How, how well did that work? Oh, it was so frustrating because <laughs> there was no, it was, it was basically like do these two things and yet there's no, like, what are the nuances to doing those things? Yeah, yeah. Because there's so many different ways to have that communication, that emotional intimacy, which we speak about in the six pillars of intimacy, as well as the recreational intimacy is those dates, those activities, those fun things. And so for me, it was always frustrating to just hear that because I'm like, okay, well, I'm, I'm not too sure how to do that. That's going to be beneficial for Elisa and I for our marriage. What does that look like? Yeah. And so when I think about being intentional and taking action, there are many little areas that we can do that. It's taking the first step towards doing something. Okay. And I know in the book, like I'm a framework guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a result driven, high D personality. Like tell me the framework. Right. Mm -hmm. How do I get from point A to point B? And I think it's good for a podcast too. Because if a listener can listen to the podcast yeah. and have a framework that they can walk away with, they mm -hmm. can go implement. Right. They can go take Stop. action. It's not esoteric. Mm -hmm. We boil it down to steps. So inside of this book, there are six pillars. Yes. Can you take us through those six? Absolutely. The first one is your emotional intimacy. And this is really, this gets into the closeness and the connection that the two of you have around your thoughts and your feelings and your desires. Yeah. It's really getting into how do we communicate? What's our body language? What's mm -hmm. our tone of voice? Because tone of voice is a big thing that I hear as a marriage coach. Well, his tone of voice or her tone of voice, you know, 
makes me so frustrated. But it's getting to that place where you're choosing to share your innermost thoughts with the person that you're in relationship with. So that's emotional. Emotional intimacy when you're choosing mm -hmm. to share your innermost thoughts. Yes. That's amazing. Keep going. Thoughts are really vulnerable. Yeah. So, really vulnerable. So the second one. For men, that's hard. It, it is. It's hard it, for women too. In what, in what Elisa and I would say is when it comes to your emotional intimacy, it is a learned skill. Mm -hmm. This is something each of us can learn if we're willing to be intentional about it and take action about it. And what would that may look like? It may mean 10 minutes a week. You just sit down. You may listen to one of our episodes and then have a conversation around it. Around that kind of as like to help spark a conversation that's a little deep. It's like, hey, here's just the, the slow ball, man. Like it, we're just laying it up there for you. So that way you guys can get some like, oh, okay, there's some ideas. What Tony said, what Elisa said. Wow, did you hear this? I, I'm, I feel that way or I don't feel that way. But this is how we could have it set up in our marriage. So we, we allow you to go and come alongside us and go, oh, we can talk about this. I feel like this is one of the hardest ones. Well, it, it ultimately is the workhorse yeah. of the six pillars because everything else comes on how the two of you communicate, right? Are you willing to be vulnerable? Are you willing to learn what feelings are and how to talk about your feelings? Are you willing to mm -hmm. create a safe space in the relationship where you can hear something from your significant other and process how that makes you feel and ask questions yeah. and then be able to go back to them and say, can we talk about this? Mm -hmm. Because not, I mean, Tony, I've been married for 26 years. Not everything that we've said in those 26 years has been, you know, rainbows and unicorns. We've, we've had a Wait, hold on. I and know. We still, your marriage isn't perfect. It's not perfect. <laughs> and we still t stub our toe around this. It's emotional intimacy, I think, is always something that if we look at it as a an area, as a pillar that we're constantly growing in, yeah. we never get to a point where we're like, well, we know everything. And so that argument we had would derail us. No, the argument we had is because there's some underlying issue that isn't resolved yeah. and it could be outside of the marriage or it mm -hmm. could be inside the marriage, but there's something there. There's some root issue. There's something that is boiling over that needs to be resolved so we can yeah. have and strengthen that pillar. And I, so I'll be vulnerable. This, I struggle so much with this in my relationship right now. This is the one area that I feel she needs the most as well. Like I, that's been communicated. I struggle with being, I can be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Like even right now I'm being vulnerable, right. but the t true emotional intimacy of it and the feelings, there's almost like a block. Mm -hmm. And I wonder because from being raised in a home where dad wasn't there, mm -hmm. he's been in prison, mom, different boyfriends, things like that. I don't think I ever saw true emotional intimacy. Mm -hmm ever. Mm -hmm. And there's people like me, a lot of them. That's why I'm being vulnerable enough to say this to you guys right now. How can you speak to that? You know, if you're working with the husband and he's like, Hey, I'm locked up. Mm -hmm. Like I feel locked up. Like she's there and I want to be more emotionally intimate, but yet there's almost like this wall that goes up. Well, I think there's two things to that. One is you've got to surround yourself with other men who are developing the skill or who have developed the skill, mm. you know, because if you never saw it modeled, then you're trying to create something and you don't have, you don't have that feedback loop of going, am I doing this right? Like, and even to the point that Tony made, you know, and this would be my second point is listen to, you know, find podcasts. I mean, there are great podcasts out there. I mean, we, we have a conversation every week where it's Tony and I talking through hard topics or funny topics or lighthearted topics. You know, we kind of cover the whole gamut, but listen to the conversations and model. Mm. what you're doing after that say okay well if tony can do this and tony brought up this you know really weird thing about you know this argument that he had with elisa and how he brought this up and it didn't go so well but then he took a step back you can do that too yeah almost learning from the framework that you're laying out there like oh well, my dad never showed me how to do that but this podcast here's a guy who's showing me how mm -hmm. to do that yeah. my dad never showed me my mom never showed me yeah. first 11 years we didn't know what the heck we were doing and we were so dysfunctional i mean every marriage has an element of dysfunction in it and, yeah. and we definitely did Right. And for the last 15 years, we were willing to step in and going, hey, if we want to have the extraordinary marriage, what are we willing to do? How are we going to be intentional and how are we going to take action mm. in this, maybe this one pillar yeah. each and every week? And that's where I wanted this to go because we have to take ownership, right, of mm -hmm. of our, our marriages, of mm -hmm. our relationships. And even in mine, that's, that's the thing is like, I want people to really get from this episode is at the end of the day, your marriage is only going to get better or your relationship with your girlfriend, if you're dating like me towards marriage, if you take ownership mm -hmm. and you're intentional and you take action, okay, I don't know what to do. Well, there are many resources today to find out what to do. Mm -hmm. So I get to hang out with Tony sometimes. So yes. I get, I get direct mentorship. I get to, to yeah. buy Tony lunch and be like, bro, how do I be a better future? husband sure right but if you don't have that 
Tony's got a podcast mm -hmm. with over 700 episodes with Elisa. Ladies and guys can listen to. So I think that's awesome around yeah. emotional intimacy. And I think, I know for me, it's going to be a continuous work. It'll never end. It'll be some I always have to strive towards. Well, and it shouldn't end because two people in a relationship are constantly changing. And yeah. growing. And Elisa and I, when we first met, I was 21. She was 19. 28 years ago, we met. If we were still living in that place of where I was a 21-year-old and she was a 19-year-old, that's not good. <laughs> Like that literally isn't good. We, we've we grown up. We've, we've had different experiences happen. Yes, we got married early and yet we're still living life through our own lenses and what we saw growing up and what we were getting, what we see around us. So, you know, that's where I think we got in that year 11 mark was like, no, we're growing, but we're still sort of stuck back to where we thought we were when we first met individually mm. and together. That's good. So what's the, the next pillar after emotional mm -hmm. intimacy? So uh, the next one is physical intimacy. Now this is- the Guys our, are saying, hey yo. <laughs> hey yo, yes, but this is our non-sexual. <laughs> They're like, dang. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to the sexual intimacy, but this is, this is the non-sexual touch. Holding hands, kissing, hugs, cuddling, whatever that may be yeah. that draws the two of you closer together and strengthens that bond between the two of you. Can it lead to sexual intimacy? Absolutely. And yet what we have found that too many folks and in marriage specifically, the physical intimacy gets sort of intertwined with the sexual intimacy and both are important. And so if we don't find out how we love to connect physically without that sexual part of it, yeah. we're, we're missing out on a lot of our marriage. It, it could be holding hands. Like for some people it's kissing. Elisa's not a big kisser. I thought she would be. <laughs> We've tried many a times over the years. I just we just had we, this conversation <laughs> with a coaching client the other day. Oh my gosh. We have a whole, we'll have a whole series on uh, the kissing game. I think it's called yeah. just because we were doing this kissing challenge and everything for every couple it's going to be different yeah and for us we've we've come to realize like ours is naked cuddling it's great it literally most of the time cody doesn't lead to anything more it's yeah. just that touch we have with one another so that's your physical intimacy no that's really good and like just even i know one of the things like um i definitely am a physical touch guy and like just putting the hand on the shoulder on mm -hmm. the back holding the hand on the leg like i know that that's something that i enjoy mm -hmm. and i also know that my significant other enjoys that too and makes her feel comfortable comforted, love, safe, things like that. But there's never an intention of that going beyond that. Right. That's so that's physical intimacy. It's yeah. almost like, hey, I'm I'm seeing you, but I don't have to I don't have to get into the emotional intimacy side. Like I don't have to say something. I don't have to say I love you. I can just move my hand over here and that can speak volumes. Right. And well, body language, they say, is like 90% of our communication. Absolutely. So wouldn't mm -hmm. that translate mm -hmm. into intimacy in a relationship? Absolutely. Like, yeah. you, And when you're together as long as you, like, you could tell, like, body language, you could probably read Tony the moment he's off. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, and it's it's so important to be able to distinguish the physical from the sexual because the reality is, is that, well, I'm sure this will come up again, but you can't have sex 24 hours a day. But you can be physically intimate yeah. with your significant other through those really meaningful touches. And that's a great question. You know, if somebody's like, well, how do I, you know, do more with physical intimacy? Ask your significant other, what touches are meaningful to you? Mm. Don't just assume, you know, mm -hmm. take the time to ask the question and really get to know what it is so that then you can deliver on that. That's so good. Ask your significant other, hey, what physical touch like means the most to you? It's and a, as a man a to ask question. a woman that oh. without the intention of sex, I would see that being powerful. She's going to light up. Absolutely. That's awesome. So what's the next one? The next one is financial intimacy. Ooh. Ooh two words that people are like, I don't think that goes in the same sentence. <laughs> That's <laughs> it's, right. It's, it's the one chapter in the book where I think we get the most like, did, did you, you say, say that? that? Why are those two words together? And the reality is, is that for every relationship, money is going to play a role. Yeah. Whether it's what's our monthly cash flow plan, whether it's, you know, we, we're planning for children or we're planning to buy a house or we're talking about retirement or we need insurance. Money is going to have a role in your relationship. And yeah. so being able to develop closeness and connection around something that is so pervasive as money, especially when money is one of the top three generally that, you know, causes of divorce, you've got to be able to get into this place of developing the skills to talk about money which is really challenging because most people are not taught how to talk about money. Yeah, We're not taught how to talk about money. We're not taught how to talk about feelings and we're not taught how to talk about sex. 
three of the six pillars. Yeah. So yeah, talking about financial intimacy, and, developing. And, and I think huge. this is a, a good pillar too to go a little deeper on because we had a conversation before coming mm-hmm. in here to record, mm-hmm. and we know that a lot of people are very uncertain about the world, especially financially, economically. Um, maybe they're already feeling the pinch, like you said, mm-hmm. Tony. Like, yeah. hey, money's getting a little tighter. Like, those are tough conversations to have. Like sitting now with your significant other, like, hey, we're we need to start cutting costs, mm-hmm. you know, and like money's getting tight and that can cause friction inside of a relationship. Can you give us some wisdom just around how to have, even when the world is chaotic, whatever state, the economy, whether it's downturning, how do they have intimacy in their finances, even when it's tough, even when someone loses a job or their stock mm-hmm. or their crypto gets cut in half? How do they maintain intimacy? Let's talk about crypto cutting in half. <laughs> We've had we've had that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We have. Uh, I felt it too, Tony. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've had a lot of still there. It's going to come back. <laughs> exactly. 20, Twenty six years, you go through a lot of financial challenges. We lost our home in 08. We had a car die on us, and we had to humble ourselves and borrow a much much older car that didn't have air conditioning in Southern California when we were living in, here in Southern California. I, I say first and foremost, don't have these conversations sitting around the dining room table or in a place where you typically talk about money. Okay. And the reason for that is there's so much energy that's built up. If it's like, oh, we have to sit down and we have to have the spreadsheets and we have to have these conversations, and then you get really uncomfortable because it's the script that you're starting to to fall into, right? Instead of getting out of the, uh, your home maybe and going for a walk and saying, hey, we're, let's just talk 10 minutes about what's going on financially. Set a timer. Mm-hmm. You know, do some things that are different yeah. so that you can have a different result. And maybe you're only talking about one aspect of your finances, but it's starting with, hey, what are the fears? Yeah. Sometimes that is the most significant question to ask. Hey, what are you most worried about right now when it comes to our finances? I might not be able to have a solution for it, but I want to know this is where, you know, the emotional intimacy comes into another pillar, right? It comes into your financial intimacy. I want to know what you're worried about. I want to know what you're thinking in terms of solutions. Your spouse might have some really great ideas that you haven't tapped into because you've never asked the question. Wow. And I think this is one of those pillars, though, too. As a team, you can come up against the problem. Mm-hmm. You and your spouse are not the problem. If you have debt, that is a problem and you have to come up with a solution to attack the debt. Mm. At one point in time in our, our marriage, we were $50,000 in debt and Elisa and I got on the same team. And it was probably the first time, this is about five years into our marriage, yeah. that we finally, for the first time in our lives, we're like, wait, we're on the same team. Yeah, We're gonna go after this thing. Doesn't matter what's happening around us, we can change what we have, we have gotten ourselves into if we sit down and we look at this together. And yeah. yes, we may have to sacrifice. And yet, what's it going to look like afterwards? Mm-hmm. And it changed our lives. Yes, we did lose everything in 08. And a little bit later, actually, it was like, oh, it was like 2010, I think, when it really finally hit us. But we built ourselves back up. Yeah, we, We've done it. But we looked at it and said, that's the problem. You're not the problem. There's a problem. We may have made mistakes each of us, and yet how are we gonna get out of this together? Is it you need to build up an emergency emergency fund? Do you need to get out of debt? Do you need to figure out, hey, how are we gonna start building up some retirement or some a, a safety for us down the road? Yeah. Come up with a plan. And sometimes they may not, you may not see it right now, like the big plan, but what's like the one thing you can start with? That's so good. And and what I heard you guys say is like to the power of a team. Mm-hmm. Like when a, a man marries a woman, it's a very good thing. And two become one, right? Like biblically yes. speaking. And like when I see that, it's like, it's so cool when man and woman are on the same side, heading towards the same direction, fighting the same issues together, nothing can stop them. But what happens I see in marriages is so much friction gets in there for whatever reasons, lack of communication, insecurity, I think even mm-hmm. from men, like, let's just go there. Yeah. Men don't want to admit that are struggling with providing for the family. Absolutely. So rather than go to the wife and sit down and be like, hey, this is what's going on right now. I want to be vulnerable so we can be on the same team. So we, I want to hear your ideas. You know, and things like that. Like imagine what difference that would make Mm -hmm. versus the man driving the finances right into the ground, self-sabotaging, because I've seen that happen with people that I know. So I I think that's amazing. So I love that the same team and for the audience guys, like be on the same team, even me and Esther, you know, we're moving towards marriage. We're in process with that. I know a lot of people keep asking about that. I got to get dad's blessing. But (laughs) we even now, like we align as a team as even boyfriend and girlfriend. Our Mm -hmm. finances aren't fully intertwined as they shouldn't be. But we also like, we communicate. We're on the same team. We know the goals. We know the dream. We know the vision. We know the roadmap. We're in agreement. 
And there's things that she challenges me on and yeah. I challenge her on. Mm-hmm. And sometimes there's a little friction. I, I got to take a pause and not be emotional and then come back and be like, dang it, you were right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and, but it's so cool. And, you know, we've been building content daily together. So right. she stepped in and yeah. I've stepped into her business. And what I've seen in that alone is exponential increase. Wow. Since we aligned together mm-hmm. and started attacking the same problems. And then you said uh, the significant other might have great ideas. Mm-hmm. Well, I know that iron does sharpen iron and in a marriage more than anything. Right. So it's like you have gifts and talents, Tony, you'll never have, bro. I know. But you got talents she'll oh, never I, have. Oh, I know. We, we, we've gone through that. It's like <laughs> trying to be Tom Brady without an offensive line. Mm-hmm. Like expecting that you're going to win the Super Bowl with no line. No, not going to happen. Not going to happen. Spiritual intimacy. And this is your, your shared practices and beliefs. And this one is most people understand it. And yet when we talk about it in the six pillars of intimacy, this is the two of you coming together. Like we can have our individual relationship. Like we have our individual relationship with our, with our Lord and savior, Jesus. And yet what's it look like when we bring that together? Mm. How are we doing that together? Because I can pray on my own. I can go to my tent of meetings and, and do my thing and get into my Bible and do what I feel is growing me and leading me closer to Christ. And yet, how do we do that together? What does that look like? Is it worshiping together? Is it praying together? Is it serving together? Is it attending services together? What does it look like that draws the two of you? Could be missions work. Mm -hmm. I mean, many a couples we know who are doing missions work together and it just charges them up and it just strengthens this pillar to see that they're walking into a town, an area, and and, and they're just seeing it being transformed by the people around them and, and themselves that they walk away going like, wow, what happened? Like the move that happened, we were a part of that together. And they did it together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, what's some things that you guys do in your marriage for spiritual intimacy? So we, was it just last year, 22? Mm-hmm. 22, we actually started, we put a, a appointment on our calendar that shows up three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, at the same time. We do prayer and communion together Come in on. our home. And that was, that was something we really, Tony really felt convicted about at the end of 21. Mm-hmm. And he's like, we're not doing this. We want to, yeah. we want to up this. Um, we've done over the years, we've done devotionals together. We've struggled at different times to find the time of day to do that because some people are like, do it first thing in the morning. And we're like, Hey, we like sleeping first thing in the morning. And then late at night, we're, well, we like sleeping then too. So finding those times to do that, you know, we go to church together. That's a big priority. For the two of us, we have served together Mm -hmm. um, in almost every role that we've had at Awaken Church. We've, I think we've done everything pretty much as a couple. There's been a few things where we've done individually, but a lot of the, uh, a lot of our big leads though, Mm -hmm. in in big lifts that we've had over the years. Yeah. We've done them as a team and serving together. And, and like you said, we're, we're different. And so what I see, she doesn't. And what she sees, I don't. And so we come together and we we can look at a problem and, and we can help our team. Back in the day, we could help them solve the issue from two different angles and and raising them up and, and letting them go do their thing. And so, yeah, we, we really have done that a lot together. I mean, we do so well yeah. in those areas. And then there are times, I mean, obviously it's sort of like we do our own thing and then we bring it back in. The prayer time that we have done and committed to, I think, has just been vitally just impactful for both of us yeah and just you know just pressing in for one another and for others that i love that time and yes we used to do devotionals doesn't mean we won't do them again in the future it's just right now yeah i think for us it's like what's the one thing Mm -hmm. again we don't have to look at each of these pillars and and stack multiple tasks this isn't trying to put more things how are you feeding that one pillar within your marriage what what does it need right now yeah and it doesn't like you said it doesn't have to be like a giant bucket list that's overwhelming and then you never do it right like even if for i would say for families that this is newer for them the concept of spiritual intimacy even just going to church together Mm -hmm. right and having a conversation about the message after grabbing brunch, talking about it, man, what'd you get out of that? I mean, that's a good starting point, right? And that's a great question because again, it comes back to understanding that the two of you are created differently and you're going to get different things. So, you know, you might sit down and totally get something out of it and then you're having a conversation with Esther. So what'd you get out of it? Esther does this every time, every time, like (laughs) I already, I know I got to be ready because she's like, so what'd you get out of that message? And you ever had those ones that you kind of daydreamed and you Uh, didn't pay a lot of attention and you, oh, oh, she'll, she'll drill me. She's like, what'd you get out of it? Like, what are your top three nuggets? (laughs) 
I like Esther wow. so much. Yeah, and she like keeps me so sharp. She and does. then I yes. say mine, and then I think they're pretty good. And then she says her, and I'm like, dang. Yeah, she she was paying attention. I wasn't. <laughs> It's kind of how that goes. Kind of how that goes. Well, hey, sometimes that happens and, it, and it's okay, but that's where we come along one another. And sometimes it, it may just be like, hey, today was just about worship for me. Yeah. I remember when my dad passed away some almost six years ago now. And I remember just being in services next to Elisa and I had no energy for anything. I mean, I was rocked. And I remember just being right there next to her, holding her hand and just crying during worship. The actual message, I couldn't remember one of them. Like my head was just like just in fog mode at that point in time. But just having her beside me holding my hand and us just worshiping together, man, it just made me feel like, oh man, I got I got a spark again. Like yeah. I, I feel something again because I was just so numb and just hurting from the loss of my dad. Wow. So good, guys. What's it's almost like, you know, God created man and woman to to go together. Or yeah. <laughs> Kind of crazy how that happens. Kind of crazy. <laughs> kind of crazy. So we got three of them so far, right? Or do we got four? Four. four? So That's we got two more. Yes. Take us to the last two. So number five is recreational intimacy. And this is, at, at its core, this is how the two of you stay close and connected in the fun things that you do and the memories that the two of you are creating. So yes, this is dates, but it's not just dates right? It's, hey, we're going to go try a new class or we're going to learn something new or we're going to travel yeah. together. It, it, so many people can get fixated on this idea that, oh my gosh, we just have to make sure a date night happens. Well, you might be in a season where date night isn't happening, but how else can the two of you create memories, right? Mm -hmm. How can you f create fun which is some, as a marriage coach, that's something I see a lot of couples like over the longevity of their marriage, they stop having fun and th they can get boring. Yeah. Um, one of the ways that Elise and I do this is we have a deck of uh, Monopoly deal. Love Monopoly deal. And we'll just, we'll just pull it out. I Our kids are, Esther. yeah, I do too. The last couple of, couple of rounds. Yeah. I've won big time. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> the little competitive comes out, it does. But, it's, but it's, but again, it's fun. No, we, no we joke. Both, phase we 10. Know. We, we, we had this and we haven't played in so long. We forgot. We, it was pretty bad. It was almost a bloodbath guys on phase 10. Wow. Yeah. It got pretty aggressive. We were YouTube and videos and rules cause we were disagreeing, but then at the end of it, we were laughing and Who it was, won? she beat me. Okay. Yeah. That, that's why it's got such that's a why deep, it's, it digs. So yeah, deep in me, I yeah. was like, I thought it for sure was going to be. You may have to get like a little tournament with yeah. her, you know, just put up a little, little. I definitely tournament. called her a cheater. She oh. wasn't. Oh, <laughs> you went there. You went there. That's. But at the end of the day, that she's going to listen to this. And I, laugh. She's going to love it. But those are the kind of fun memories that we're talking about with this yeah. recreational intimacy because we can get so wrapped up in oh I've got to do this for work and I've got to do this for my friends mm. and I've got to do this for church and I've got like we can get through all our to dos and forget that spending time with and having fun with the person that we're married to is super important for the health of the relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's why really pouring into this pillar can be such a game changer for so many couples, bringing back that fun, bringing back the desire to create memories. Yeah. So I went to a, a connect group with uh, couples and we were actually going through the six pillars of intimacy. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. this was the theme that night. And I want to just address something because I, I saw it mentioned a lot there okay. and it was, it was having kids and, and how much this area lacked in, it almost intimidated me, like of having kids because people seemed that there was no room mm. for recreational intimacy. Speak to those people, a lot of my audience too, right? They're mm -hmm. probably in that season where they have children and what they did in dating and married before kids was so much different. Now they have kids, they feel like they don't have the time, they can't sure. take the trip, they can't do the thing because of the kids. Mm -hmm. But we know that that still has to be a priority in marriage. Mm -hmm. So like, what advice do you give to those that have kids and maybe it's even new for them? Sure. I'm going to go back say, to- You one, have to go back to your favorite. Yeah. One of my favorite memories. And, and when we talk about this area, Elisa, Elisa sh uh, shared this, it doesn't have to be like extravagant every single time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where society today has brought us to. Everything on social media is always mm -hmm. like- Oh my gosh, we went to the best steakhouse and we went to this amazing, like we, we saw the most amazing Broadway show and we did this and, and we think that recreational intimacy is that. Mm. And I would push back and say, it's not that. Yeah, It can be, but it may be once a year. Where are you being close and connected and having fun together in the special moments. And I remember when our kids were younger, favorite times, and I still remember this, Elise and I had two, we had two of them, and um, we would both put them to bed. Each of us would take one kid. Whoever got their kid down first would run out and go buy dinner. 
We're old enough that we're like pre DoorDash. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now you yeah, got got it's like so and we're so now. spoiled. Like so now, now, now you, you got Uber Eats house. and everything. Like so, if I got my child done down first, <laughs> then I would run, go grab something, come home, lay out a blanket, lay out some candles, put some music on, lower and dim the lights, and we would just sit on the blanket, and we'd have dinner, and then we would play a game. Mm-hmm. Mm. And literally, we have gone on hundreds and hundreds of dates. Elise and I have. To all over the place, no matter where we are here in San Diego or other places. But that one, for some reason, and we did it many a times, but but that activity just left and has left such a an impact on me because it wasn't fancy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It wasn't us dressing up. It was it was just us sitting on the carpet on a blanket, just having some fun together. Wow. And I think with most of us, when we're raising our children, they do take a lot. And what I would challenge you is find some time, find 30 minutes a week and do something for each other. Because if you don't, they are eventually going to leave the house. They are eventually going to say, Hey, mom and dad, you guys were awesome. You've raised us as you should. And then you're going to be looking at one another going, what do we do? Yeah. And that's a scary spot. If you haven't invested time in your marriage, yeah, you look at one another and you're like, I don't know you anymore. Wow. So I probably don't want to be married to you. You know, I, I think because mm-hmm. they must have learned from you, like the idea is similar to that. So we moved our date nights to Wednesday because being an entrepreneur in ministry and mm-hmm. all these things, trying to keep on the weekends. And we try to have fun on Saturday. Like that's yeah, one of our themes. That is my- but like date nights Wednesday. And yeah. we try to alternate like, hey, I'll take lead on this mm-hmm. week, figuring something out. You do it next week. And uh, so I was like, I learned from that. I think someone shared learning from you guys. And uh, so we did the blanket, but we went to consignment shops and we went hunting for games yes. and we yeah. went to like Goodwills and consignment yeah. shops and we bought like OG games, like shoots and ladders Great game. and like, sorry, uh, the the one that's like, sorry, shuffle. And like, we got all these old games we played How as fun. kids. And then we, I cooked, I cooked steak, you know, yeah. some okay, good dinner. Yeah. And Let's then go. we had a blanket and I have a fireplace in my condo. And that was like our date night. Yeah. And you know what? It was one of the cheapest date nights, I feel like. Like, it really wasn't. Like, there were a couple dollars for those games. Some steaks were like $12 each. And we had the best time. Yeah. Sure. So, and th- so I want you guys to know that's an impact ripple. You weren't even yeah. in the room when that was shared, but we were studying your book from other people that had learned from uh-huh. you that were teaching me. Yeah. That's so cool. So cool. And, 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 the, and the biggest thing is when we are raising kids, our energy levels can be high and low, just depending on where they're at. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's something that we just all have to understand. It is a big lift. Raising kids is a big lift. Not only when they're little, as they get older, it's a big lift as well. Our, our oldest played football Friday nights. You better believe we were, we were football family. We are a football family. We would be out there. I mean, the times at practices and this and, and that, and yet Elise and I would find time. Another way to do something like this too, would just be as they got older and they could stay home, we just go out, get to the beach, go for a walk on the beach. Yeah. You, you know, there, there are different things that you can do to foster this, to strengthen this pillar mm. and, and not let the kids take over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's Absolutely. so good. I like how you said like strengthen this pillar. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, Strong. It is. Strong. It, the Tony, Tony's been strong. bragging about his biceps guys. Yeah, Cause oh. if we, we said we'd mention it in the show. <laughs> we talk about those. Cody kept his jacket on. Cause he I, yeah, I was intimidated, man. I'm like, I'm going to keep the jacket on for the show, Tony. Cause <laughs> he looks good for 49. He does. Thank really you very much, stud. baby doll. See this marriage, guys? That's what you want. So we got one more pillar, right? Yes. yes. Let's go to her. Last one is the sexual intimacy pillar. That's what everybody's been waiting on. Well, That's you know, the one. It, they do think we should start the book with it, but if we started the book with that, you might not read the rest of them. Yeah. So it's very intentional. Good marketing. Yeah, go to, go to the end. Go to the end. But this is, I mean- Keep you it, reading. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's, you know, everything that's involved in your sex, the closeness and connection the two of you have around your sex life, but it's not just sexual intercourse. You know, a lot of people will hear sex and intimacy and actually use those words interchangeably. But the reality is when you start talking about foreplay and initiating and even kind of, as I say with a lot of my coaching clients, kind of what's on your buffet when it comes to your sexual intimacy, right? Because there's a lot of different actions that you can choose from as a married couple, but being able to develop the See, language. most people didn't know that there was a buffet or a five course meal. Oh, no, I, I yeah, I, that was a revelation I had with coaching clients probably a year, maybe two years ago now. I don't know. I'm not in those calls with you. Yeah, it was, it was a situation where, you know, they were, it was either we were having sex or we weren't having sex. So it was a very black and white conversation. And I said, well, it doesn't just have to be about intercourse. And they both looked at me and I go, think about it. Like we used to back in the day have soup plantation here in San Diego Mm -hmm. way back in the day. And so like you walk in 
Right. And if you walk in with kids, kids are going straight for the ice cream. Like they are just like, yes, they would forget the healthy food. Uh, like I'm not interested yeah. in anything else straight for the ice cream. But then you have the people that are like, Oh, maybe I want a salad today. And some people are like, Oh, maybe I'll have a baked potato. And some people get everything. You can do the same thing with the acts that the two of you consider sexual intimacy. If you talk about it, because oh. now you've got all of these different options. And so you can say, Hey, I might not be up for sexual intercourse tonight. Maybe, you know, somebody's not feeling well, but we can do this instead. Like I'd be up mm. for doing this. Yeah. And so you can take away the rejection factor of it just being a yes or no when it comes to sexual intercourse. And you can go into this place of really adding depth mm. and just all of this nuance to the yeah. sexual connection the two of you have in your relationship. Initiating, we bring in the foreplay, we bring in obviously sexual intercourse, but we expanded that sexual intimacy for a purpose. So it's not just like, we're going to just go have sex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. How are we initiating? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Because that's huge because a lot of couples, men and women are rejected at that point because mm -hmm. they don't even understand what it looks like to initiate or if their spouse is initiating. And if they do initiate, did they even understand it? Right. So even just starting from there, and Elisa and I have gone through this so we can speak to it and understanding like, oh, you're initiating? Okay, I didn't even know that's the way you were initiating. I thought you were just rubbing my forearm. You, you know what I mean? It's like, cool, you're rubbing my forearm. A little physical intimacy there. But for Elisa, that rubbing of forearm is sort of like, hey, like, let's go do something here a little later. You have to learn these things. You ask, get into your emotional intimacy. Going into that foreplay, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you have lubes? Do you want to bring in like a sex pillow or a sex ramp or something of that nature? Do you want to yeah. bring in a sexy board game and, and have some fun and role play some things together and all this sort of stuff and then get into that sexual intercourse? Mm -hmm. And so by expanding it, we're helping couples to see, oh, wow, there's much more. There's much more than and just And I like the, the initiation too, because that's not something that's really taught. You just try to try to figure that out on your own, uh -huh. right? And then that that rejection, right? Like if you're trying to initiate that with your significant other and you feel rejected right. mm -hmm. and turned down from that, like that even caused more issues. Mm -hmm. So then maybe there's fear of doing it again sure. or Absolutely. feeling of not being wanted. But maybe the other person just had no clue that you were trying to initiate it. Well, and that happens in a lot of cases. And, and so if you don't have the conversation, hey, here are some of the ways that I can initiate or I might initiate. It's still, they might not you know, pick up what you're putting down. And so you might have to say, Hey, this is me initiating, just trying to let you know what and I'm then doing. Like communicate, right? Yeah. Communicate because even if you've told them, there might be times when he or she is so distracted. It's like, Hey, I'm actually like, I'm trying to connect with you here. Just come into the moment with me. And it's an invitation instead of like, Oh, I can't believe you rejected me. I can't believe you didn't see what I was doing. I can't. And then you just yeah. create this greater distance. Yeah. It's so good guys. Mm -hmm. Wow. Six pillars of intimacy. Yeah. You know, there's something I want to ask you guys, because um, I know you guys know this well. You guys run one extraordinary marriage together. Mm -hmm. You're an entrepreneur couple, and, you know, I'm in a relationship. We're both entrepreneurs. We both run businesses. And at times, that can be hard. There's so yeah. much blessing, right, that we get different freedoms, and we get to spend more time in a day together than, you know, a couple that works two different nine-to-five jobs. Sure. Mm -hmm. But within that, there's it's hard to separate business and intimacy. Mm -hmm. How do you guys do it? And what advice do you have for entrepreneur couples, whether they're married or dating? Because I've seen it go both ways. Mm. I've seen the most incredible, most incredible power couples that build businesses together and literally like change the world like you guys. Mm -hmm. Then I've seen ones that have completely ruined their relationship mm -hmm. and their marriage. And they have so much resentment towards one another. Mm -hmm. How do us entrepreneur couples not fall into that latter category but rather be on the same team and prioritize intimacy, not just business, making money, building things. I think we have to put up some guardrails and that can be tough, obviously, because there is a lot of that gets intertwined. Something that Elise and I have done and I have found it, and I think she would agree with this, is that when we go somewhere and we're eating and we, we sit across from each other, it's open invitation to be like, okay, we're gonna talk about life, business can come up, it's cool conversation. And yet if we sit next to each other, shoulder to shoulder, this is us time. Mm. This is marriage time. So this you guys is, know if she sit next to you, signal. I'm not bringing business up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you have to be willing to say, Hey, like this isn't the time or place to bring this up right now. And, and I get it. Cause I love business. I love what we get to build together. I love the one family and we get to serve them. I love our team. And yet there are just times when it's like, okay, we got to just, we got to just put a time out on this. Like we just, we needed to just take a break and it needs to be about us. 
And, and we're intentional about creating time when we're not talking about business. There are some, you know, we, Tony mentioned earlier, we're, we've been a football family. We love college football. So mm-hmm. college football Saturdays are a thing. Like we don't oh, work yeah. Yeah. during college football season. Um, on Saturdays. And that's, we don't really even talk. I mean, it's all about football. Like, it's all about yeah. football Who on cares? Saturdays. Like, so you guys have something else outside of business yes. that you have in common that you have fun doing. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, we make time to get out of our home and shift because we both work from home. And so we make time to get out of that space and shift and do other things so that it's not all work all the time. Yeah. And I think that's a really big thing that entrepreneurial couples have to be mindful of is being in that place of saying, hey, we need to actually take a break from mm-hmm. this so that we can be rejuvenated so that we have more to give to our audiences and we have more energy to just tap into ourselves. And just seeing it in that way, it helps be like, oh, this is actually going to help us more mm-hmm. in this area by taking more time over here. Absolutely. That's so good, guys. Sure. Well, guys, we're, we're coming to the end of the show and uh, I just want to honor you guys and thank you so much for coming on here for this interview. Like it means a lot to me, first of all, and I, I know it means a lot. The messages I get from the impact this show's been making and it's it's cool. I've never had anyone come on the show that really speak to people, relationships, marriage, sex, subjects that aren't talked about enough in society. Sure. Every time I'm around you guys, every event I've ever been to that you've spoken at, every mastermind, the podcast, your book, whatever it is, I'm always picking up nuggets, oh, making you. me a better man, and it's going to make me a better husband. So thank you guys. Well, thank oh, you're you so welcome. Thank you for having us. I mean, Cody, we think the world of you. So, so we it's got one privilege. last question. All right. Okay. So what's next for One Extraordinary Marriage? And what's next? I'm going to do separate for okay. Tony and Elisa. I'll let you do what's next for One Extraordinary Marriage. Okay. Um, group coaching. So I have been coaching one-on-one for the last 10 years and we're moving into a group coaching. Um, we're launching that in April of 2023. And what's next for Tony and Elisa? Well, our youngest graduates in oh, about a year and a half. Yeah. And so for us, it's going to be travel. We, we really want to travel. And on our 20th anniversary, we went down to Peru mm-hmm. and with her going off and and doing her thing. We feel like we got probably a good five years time before our kids begin to settle down and do their thing. So we want to travel. We want to, we want to just go experience. We got married young and we, we got right into work. And so we feel like we have built something that we can do anywhere and we can do anywhere. Yeah. And so we want to go meet others who are in the one family Mm -hmm. and uh, just enjoy, just enjoy this time and um, just see different cultures and in, in, in different places. Have fun. Have yeah. fun. Enjoy life. I work. love how the thing that you build empowers the dreams that you have. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's the real goal of it. And guys, I just want to say for a moment, like I don't think you guys understand how incredible of a coach Elisa is when it comes to marriage coaching. Like I personally think we were just talking about that you're the best in the world. Well, thank you. That there's nobody else that can yeah. do what these guys do. But I know mm-hmm. Elisa does primarily the coaching. Mm-hmm. And the fact that she's opening up group coaching is a big deal because she's fought it for so long. From uh-huh. what I know, I'm, just, I don't, I'm okay saying that. <laughs> I oh, absolutely. You're, you're right. You're right. And uh, it's a big deal because you're going to be able to impact more people. So where can people connect with you guys? So like definitely get the book, guys. Like it's, I don't know, 20 bucks on Amazon. It'll change your marriage. The podcast is where the goal is. I always tell people go to one. Ex- and they are the number one marriage podcast in the world. Like that's a pretty big mantle. But someone's like, you know what? I listened to this interview. I really like you, Elise. I really like you, Tony, I want to know more. I think my marriage could use this. How do they get connected with you? Everything's at one extraordinary marriage.com. Just come to the website. You'll be able to find everything that you're looking for and more. One extraordinary marriage.com. Uh, social media. I'm a social media guy. Where can they find you in there? At one extraordinary marriage. Wow. It's like, it's easy or something. Yeah. You know, a lot of consistency. Consistency hey, is good. When you started 13 years ago, like you, you picked it all up when we did as everything just kept coming around, we just made sure to just grab it one after yeah. another, after another. Yeah. Guys, the podcast, the Instagram, you know, their book, like yeah. their website, go check them out. We're so honored to have you guys. And I just want to say, guys, I usually say make today great. But today I'm going to say, go make your marriage great.